stage without having adequately investigated this suspicious individual. If they had simply asked him to stand down while they investigated, they would have discovered the shooter and this shooting uh, would never have occurred in the first place. Next, the Secret Service simply tried to delegate to local law enforcement their responsibilities, which are to keep their protectees safe. And the uh, acting director made the point of saying Secret Service are the elite in law enforcement, and I believe that's true. These are the best of the best. But then for some reason, when it came to pr providing protection to, for President Trump, they delegated this to local law enforcement, obviously people less trained to deal with the sorts of threats that uh, they saw that day, resulting in another point of failure. But finally, the lack of communication or ability to communicate the threat to the agents on the stage with the president was another point of failure. Because if they had been able to have simply a walkie-talkie or radio which would have communicated from the field directly to the agents, they could have asked the president to keep his seat and to stay out of harm's way. So thanks to, uh, thanks to the uh, divine intervention, President Trump did not lose his life that day. I told him that it's obvious God has other plans for him. But the fact of the matter is the social, that, uh, that the Secret Service has now been transferred since 2003 to the Department of Homeland Security. Now, why should that cause any of us concern? Well, you've seen the job that the Department of Homeland Security is doing at the southern border with about 10 million people released in the interior of the United States. Alejandro Mayorkas should have resigned years ago, completely incompetent, lied to Congress repeatedly, and now he's in charge of the Secret Service because they're part of the Department of Homeland Security. Obviously, we need to look at this matter from top to bottom, and we need to fix the uh, Secret Service so no future candidates or existing office holders are exposed to this sort of threat again. Thanks, John. I just want to put an explanation point on this, and we'll open it up to questions. I think my colleagues did an excellent job of pointing out both the individual and systemic failures by the Secret Service on the day of this assassination uh, attempt. And that's why we need a crisis intervention team to go in right now. We don't have to wait to see what the findings are from, this, from all the studies that we're doing right now. That being said, we need to make sure we uncover every stone, and that's why we need some type of an independent, non-political commission to dive deep into this. So we'll stop there. Some questions, Josh, in the back, go ahead. Was there ever any discussion in the planning stage about communicating from the advance team to Trump security detail or to campaign risks of the clear line of sight from the ATR data? We, based on your discussions with Secret Service? We haven't got any of that. They, they, they haven't told us that. It was a I mean, a simple question was just why wasn't it in Cyber Perimeter to begin with? Mm -hmm. That'd be the simple question, right? That hasn't even been answered. Uh, we haven't been told how many how many rings of perimeters that they had. They had one, two, or three. I mean, obviously they had two, but did they have a third one to push out? This is only 150 yards, 140 yards from, from the platform. It, it, when you're setting up a perimeter, you take all points of advantage. You take the water tower and you take every building around there that has direct sight. That is your third perimeter. That's your outer perimeter. So there's no, th there was obviously no communication about it, but it would be the Secret Service that would be in charge of setting out the site planning to begin with. So I would assume not, but they haven't told us. Bill, I think the frustrating me is that there, that there was no standard of operating uh, procedures defined or followed. Where should this first perimeter be? How far should it go out? Should there be any buildings left within 500 yards of the president with a direct line? Well, obviously there should not be. Um, w when do we decide to give President Trump more protection? There seemed to be no guidance. It seemed to be too political of an opportunity here. John? Uh, well, sir, I was going to ask. Uh, I know I think it came up during the hearing that uh, someone said they thought there were about 1,500 people short in terms of manpower. Is it conceivable that, that it's a budget issue, that they don't have the coverage, that they don't have the financial resources? I think we've doubled their budget in the last 10 years. They have 8,000 agents protecting 33 people. Uh, that they need to be able to roll up the people that are sitting and doing nothing in those offices. And I say nothing. I don't mean I shouldn't be that cavalier. They are doing important things. But obviously, 
uh, in this situation, President Trump probably needed four or five times that. I would argue that it would be next to impossible to make that particular site uh, safe for the president. Um, it's it's going to take more than just throwing money at it. And I think certainly it starts with leadership. And that's what we're lacking right now is, is leadership. The, the AIC would be the one that would, the agent in charge, would be the one the that mic? would act that, right? I'm sorry. The, the AIC would be the agent in charge of the site. That'd be the agent in charge of the whole, uh, the the whole venue that was setting up the the uh, protective uh, perimeters. Would be the one that would set how many personnel he needs to guard it specifically. And so that would be one question that would need to be asked: Was a request given, and was it denied? That'd be a simple communication because that should be those site plans. For 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 uh, the setting up the perimeters, that should have been given out uh, to. I mean, that should be documentation. There's no question about it. I mean, when we used to do site planning, we would actually draw it out, and that'd be part of the briefing. You would put it up on the wall, or you'd put it out on emails. You know, tell you how long ago I would do. I was doing it, but you'd put it up on the wall, and you would actually assign here's building A, B, C, D, or building one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, and how many people it's going to take to secure that building and block off all, all, those, all that whole perimeter. And that would be your personnel that you set by those perimeters. So without that, we don't know. We don't know actually how many people were actually needed to, to protect that site to make it secure. Well, so given, given what happened, I think it's indisputable that there were not sufficient agents assigned to protect Donald Trump. That for that location, that roof was not secured, there were not agents in place, to be aware of the, of the sniper. There were not agents in place. There were not counter snipers who had visibility on, 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 the, on the shooter. There was no aerial assets. We know from public reporting there have been multiple requests from the Trump team for additional uh, agents, for additional equipment, and that those requests have been turned down. A at the hearing, I asked, what is the relative size of the Secret Service detail that was assigned to Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, compared to the Secret Service detail that is assigned to Joe Biden, compared to the Secret Service detail that is assigned to the First Lady. There were reports that on the day of the, uh, of the, of the rally, the Secret Service transferred agents from Donald Trump's detail to protect the First Lady. Now, look, it is important to protect the First Lady. But the acting director refused to answer any question about the relative size of how many agents are assigned and what I believe happened is the Secret Service was treating Donald Trump as a former president. Former presidents are given Secret Service details, but not that extensive a Secret Service details. Typically, the threat profile a former president is facing is significantly less than Donald Trump is facing. Donald Trump is not just a former president. He is the Republican nominee to be president, and he is one of two people who is likely to be the next president of the United States. And it's why the request of the threat levels, how many threats, how many credible threats there are, is so important because this decision is supposed to follow the threats. And, and, and I believe what, what the Department of Homeland Security did, what Alejandro Mayorkas did, is they didn't want to assign that additional protection because they didn't want to confer, I guess, legitimacy to Trump. I think it is the very same reasoning that led them to deny a Secret Service de detail to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., because the fact that RFK Jr. is running is politically inconvenient to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and giving Secret Service detail would legitimize it. If that's their reasoning, Congress and the American people deserve to see in writing why they said no, because if you're actually doing your job, the job of the Secret Service, there clearly should have been additional agents. There should have been an agent on that room roof. The shooter should have been detained and questioned, and there should have been aerial assets. None of those happened, and today, Secret Service answered none of those questions as to why they didn't happen. Go ahead. Hi, Monty. Thank you. Uh, finance with AP. Um, you mentioned you guys would like an independent, non-political commission. Can you talk about, first of all, what that would look like? Is that different than what's happening in the House side? They have a bipartisan commission that they've, um, you know, they've put up. Is this is there an effort to streamline what the House and Senate are doing so that you guys don't overlap, that you don't, you know, get it interfering with each other's sources? Obviously, you know, Senator Johnson and, and Grassley have their own whistleblower program and, and sources that they have. Is there an effort to streamline this because there is bipartisanship? 
I, I don't see an effort to streamline it on both sides. It appears to me, as usual, each uh, house up here is going to do their own thing. To me, the big difference is it's apolitical. Neither re Republicans nor Democrats, people that really I don't know what party they belong to, experts in the field that are going to go out and do the hard work. And then they could feed the results to those particular committees. But I think it's more of a 9-11 style commission where there are apolitical, non-political people out there that are true experts in the field that had the time to do this. We don't have the time nor the staff to get to the answers we quickly need to. I think that this is something that the president could, uh, t could appoint. I think it's something that if the House and Senate leadership got together, they could do as well. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Senator, yeah, Deputy FBI Director said that they didn't have any solid evidence on the motive for the shooter, but then they go ahead and mention a social media account that might be uh, the shooter that, that had apparently posted anti-immigration and anti-Semitic uh, uh, posts. Uh, do you think that was appropriate by the deputy FBI director, or do you think that's part of Senator Cruz said of the political bias in the, in the leadership? Uh, look, it's difficult to tell because there was very little transparency from the FBI either. Uh, the CEO of Gab has said that there was a social media page of the shooters that indicated that he was a left-wing activist. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but the FBI certainly didn't acknowledge it. And, and I will say, look, I think one of the most concerning aspects of the Biden-Harris administration over the last four years has been the politicization of law, of law enforcement, the politicization of the Department of Justice, of the FBI, of the entire machinery of government. And, and, and so it, it raises natural questions that is the FBI uh, partially revealing information to frame a political narrative? Because they're not transparent, because they're not telling us what they found, because they are stonewalling and the Secret Service is really stonewalling, uh, it is difficult to know what the facts are. I think the American people have a right to know the facts. Yeah. So in the very back, go ahead. Um, can I ask, this was the first time today that we heard from the new acting director, Roe. Do the three of you have confidence in him as the acting director? Do you think he should remain on in that position or not? Okay. Can you answer? I, I, I uh, have a very simple term to this. The proof's in the pudding, right? If he comes transparent and he's open, uh, and honest with Congress, I think that speaks volumes. I'm not. I'm not concerned about him capable, uh, his capabilities because he has uh, he has you know a, quite a historic record of being very capable of doing his job. It's just how he handles it moving forward. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, uh, and until he proves us wrong. I, I I think it's I think it's next to impossible to take any person from within the Secret Service to turn it around right now. I've been through enough things personally in my life, whether it was a coaching problem or a superintendent problem or a pastor that needed to go, and there was a big major cultural issue within that organization that it takes somebody from outside to come in and actually objectively evaluate the situation, that there are such significant cultural breakdowns within the Secret Service right now, it literally is going to take a crisis management team. I think he's fine in his role right now as acting director, but I don't think that he has the skill set or the objective ability to turn this Secret Service around and take it to the place where America has confidence in it once again. I think that his unwillingness, as I hear him say, I take responsibility, but but I'm not going to tell you if we actually had our meeting that morning or not with him. And he didn't know if they'd really had a meeting with the local police or not. His unwillingness to say who makes the decision when it comes to who gets Secret Service and how much. It was, again, he, he was too focused on covering the actions of the Secret Service. So I don't think that he has the ability to turn this around. Somebody needs to stay in place from within, but we really need an entire new management team in there and shake this place up. I do. I, I believe the Secret Service uh, director should be Senate confirmed. I'm supporting legislation to do precisely that. But, but let me say on, on your question a moment ago, I'm going to agree with Mark Wayne, that, that, that the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, I thought the acting director's testimony today was markedly better than the testimony of the previous director. The previous director demonstrated, to my mind, an almost complete contempt for the notion of accountability and would not answer any questions and in fact maintained effectively that the Secret Service had done nothing wrong. 
and, and the proof of it was that President Trump was still alive when it is, had, the, had that bullet been a half inch to the left, history would have been different and President Trump would have been murdered that day. That is a total security failure on the part of the leadership of Secret Service. So the acting director, I was glad in his opening remarks, he stood up and took responsibility and admitted at the outset it was indefensible that that roof was not secured, that that, that, that was a good place to start. But then his testimony was disappointing that repeatedly he refused to answer straightforward questions, questions he should have known the answer to. And for me, it's going to come down to two things. Number one, how he responds to the questions for the record. I will be submitting a number of questions for the record. Other members of the committee will. Detailed questions in writing, and what I expect from the acting director is complete candor and transparency. If he behaves as he did this afternoon, circling the wagons and wanting to protect everyone at Secret Service to say we did nothing wrong, I think that will demonstrate he is not qualified for that job and does not understand the magnitude of the stakes. So I think question number one, does he demonstrate candor and transparency? And number two, is he able to change how Secret Service operates? Look, the most compelling question is what are they doing differently today? The shooter in Butler, Pennsylvania was not the last threat to any of the protectees under Secret Service protection. What is Secret Service doing today to do differently? Are they su assigning sufficient agents? Are they using assets? Are they using air assets? Are they using drones? Are they using helicopters? Are they going and questioning suspicious individuals? Have they worked through the communication if they're relying on local law enforcement and yet they can't communicate with them? That needs to be fixed immediately because the most compelling priority is to make sure, God forbid, another assassin does not carry out another attempted assassination or successful assa assassinations. That's 